Hi, everybody. It's David Siegel. Thank you for joining me. Uh, today is uh, Wednesday, the 7th of December. Uh, Ether is at about $400 on Polonia because I haven't checked. And I am in, I am in Gibraltar. And I just wanted to show you quickly, those are, that's uh, Spain over there. I'm at a fantastic law office for meetings. That's, that's Gibraltar. That's Spain over there. And if I took you up to the window and looked into the glare, you'd you would see Morocco. So today is an exciting day. I have a quick announcement to make. The ICO show is over. Uh, it was taking way too much of my time and it was fun, but as the CEO of the Pillar Project and, and 2030, I just couldn't devote that much time to it. We are now hiring and building a team in London for Pillar University, Pillar Media, to communicate to the world about the Pillar Project and our wallet coming out. So if you're interested in that, please get a hold of me, David at 2030.io. I know you're going to see a bit of a lag between my mouth and my voice, but that's okay because we're going to spend most of our time here talking about blockchain, token types, and business models. This is my, my big deck of all my uh, different uh, webinars, and today we'll spend the next hour talking about blockchain token types and business models. Much of this material is in the tokenhandbook.com, the only book on tokens. And our agenda today is to go over tokens and offerings as they are today. So this is going to be a bit of an advanced class on tokens. Uh, talk about a new token framework and then some guidelines for sellers and buyers of tokens. And right now I'm going to go to a quick question. By the way, some people complain that my audio isn't very good. Well, now I have a Blue Yeti mic, and I hope it's much better than it has been before. So please tell me in the questions uh, if you can hear me and if it, uh, if it sounds good or not, because it's an expensive mic, and I've lugged it all around, and I hope you find this audio quality better. Now, I'm going to start with a quick question. We're talking about tokens today, and I hope you know a bit about tokens, blockchain tokens. So we'll start with this question. Is a lottery ticket a token? Here's the ch your chance to vote to see what everyone knows. This is not actually an easy question. Is a lottery ticket a token? Yes, no, other. Start voting now because I don't have all day. This will be a one-hour presentation. Uh, there will be probably about 15 minutes for questions toward the end. And some people say, no, a lottery ticket is not a token. Some people say, yes, although not so many, uh, not so many people voting yet. We have 250 people here. So quickly vote. Is a lottery ticket a token? We're going to start to try to figure out what a token is. And for that, I'm going to start with tokens and tokening offerings. And that is, let's talk about the difference between a coin and a token is a coin is, try to make it bigger, oh, there we go. A coin is a general purpose unit of value in a system. It's general purpose, it kind of works on anything in the system, whether it's a dollar or a Bitcoin or an Ether. Uh, a coin is general purpose and a token is not value, it represents value. A token is an IOU <clears throat> that represents value or access to a system, and it has a specific purpose in that system. So is a lottery ticket a token? Well, a bunch of people have said no, a bunch of people have said yes. The answer, the answer, and I'll, I'll stop voting now because I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is, uh, it depends. <laughs> a winning lottery ticket is a token because it can be redeemed for money. A losing token or an undetermined token before the lottery draw takes place is not a token. It can't be redeemed for anything. It effectively has no value. Uh, you could, I guess, sell it to someone else for what you paid for it. That's not a token. So it only has a token if it can be, if it's an IOU for something, if it can be redeemed for something. So a winning lottery ticket is a token and a non-winning lottery ticket is not a token. So that's our first question. Let's go to the next one. Is, make this live now, is a password a token. Is a password a token? If you have a password in your mind, 
to log you into some system. Is that a token? Is a password a token? We've got 283 people here. We ought to get 200 votes in the next 20 seconds. Remember, a token represents a unit of value or in or access to a system, and it has a specific purpose in that system. Certainly, a password is to log you in. So a bunch of people say a password is a token. I'm going to, uh, I can't move on until I give the answer, so I'm going to give the answer right now. Um, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so here's, and here's how it depends. A password in your mind is not a token, no. Uh, it's just, it's what we call a virtual key. Uh, it's not a token because it can't be used as itself. You have to have it go through your fingers, your fingertips, or speak it or somehow. Now, what if I write down a, my password to some system and I hand you the piece of paper? Is that a token? The answer there is it's not if it's a normal system. However, if there were some system that could automatically scan that piece of paper and do some optical character recognition and recognize that, password on the piece of paper and then let you into the system or do something or exchange some value, then yes, that piece of paper would be a token because a token needs to have a substrate. And you would learn that at thetokenhandbook.com. So I'll stop that one. I'm checking uh, what people are saying. Okay. Sound quality is great. I'm glad to hear that. Whew. <laughs> I'm really getting uh, better with my technical challenges. <laughs> so, look, we've had tokens for thousands of years to represent value, and we still use them every day. In fact, your wallet or your purse is full of them. Uh, there's likely to be one in your pocket right now. You may have a key fob or a chip and pin or something with a barcode on it. That's going to be a token that plays a specific role in a specific system. And, of course, We've now had, I think we're coming up on $3.8 billion worth of token sales on the blockchain this one. Some people may recognize the Pillar project. Thank you if you have purchased our Pillar tokens. And they look like this. Uh, they just look like numbers. Not too different from a lot of other digital tokens, just a kind of a long gobbledygook number. And if you think about a coin, it's actually a type of token, but it's a very general purpose type. And there's only three things you can do with a coin, by the way. You can only do three things. You can mine it or create it. You can give it to someone or you can trade it. And that's it. That's all that coins are good for. And uh, on the other hand, tokens have a specific purpose, as we know. So these are kind of four types of tokens plus another category that we will learn about and that I talk about in, in the token handbook. Now, when it comes to systems, and this is why we have tokens, we have tokens because of this. Because today, in data centers and in many systems today, we have three things in one place. We have all the business logic is in uh, the data center. Also, the value is in the data center, like the valuable data or, or uh, currency is in the data center, in, dits, in bit, digits. And then we have the keys also are in the data center and everything gets managed in the data center, inside the walls of the data center. And that's, if you've been watching previous podcasts of mine or a webcast, you know that we lose about $500, uh, $500 billion worth of data and, and uh, records through the theft of data centers. And that's what we're trying to fix. So on the blockchain, when we have a token offering, this is kind of our, our, our architectural stack. We don't really care where the business logic is. It could be on Amazon Web Services. Uh, it could be on a central server. It could be a bunch of smart contracts. It could be decentralized. It doesn't matter uh, because there's no real value in the services. Then the value, which would be the assets, um, you know, digital assets, they can also be decentralized or centralized as long as they're encrypted with hard encryption. It doesn't matter. But we tokenize the keys and we atomize the keys so that you own your keys that give you access. And those are the tokens that you care about. They give you access to use the logic on your uh, assets or to purchase things or, and to, to get other value out of the system. So by tokenizing and atomizing the keys, we 
dis distribute them only to into your wallet so no one else can get them. Nobody in any company could get those keys. You have them privately. That's what's so exciting about the token economy. And then uh, by atomizing the value, uh, we, we take away the concentration risk so that uh, uh, there's it's much less chance of being hacked. Now, tokens have flow models. There are three flow models. It goes in a circle that is essentially like a, 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 like a currency. A, a, you know, a dollar bill kind of never stops becoming a dollar bill. You don't burn it when you acquire something. You give it to someone, and they give it to someone, they give it to someone. That's the velocity of money. So it just keeps going around and around in a circle. You can actually never redeem a dollar. It's not good for anything but what someone else will give you for it. And you can go in a straight line, and the idea here is to think about poker chips. Uh, with poker chips, you start with cash at the cashier, then you get your chips, then you go to the various tables where they offer you, uh, you know, things you can do with them. You play a game, you give them the chips, then of course at the end, if you play enough, you lose all of it and the, the dealer ends up with chips. Well, the dealer can't pay her rent in chips or buy dinner with chips, so the dealer takes them to the cashier and gets cash. And that's, uh, that cash is the most liquid form of token there is. Uh, and so then can pay her rent and, and buy things. And you'll notice this is for a single system. You can't take those tokens, those poker chips, across the street to the other casino. They won't recognize them. So it's always for a specific system. And the other model is that they go from source to sink. An example would be a, 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 an airline seat on an, a seat on an airplane on a certain day. Um, after that flight lands, then that, that token is no longer valid. Whether you used it or not, it's, it's dead. Can't use it again. Or a, a prescription, you can't reuse a prescription. It goes from source to sink. So if you were designing tokens, as I do, some of us are token designers, then you'd have the physical attributes. If you were designing like a machine, this is the machine you would go up to, the vending machine that spits out tokens, you'd have to push all these nut buttons and knobs. And on the physical side, these are programmed into the smart contract. Uh, and they're sort of, uh, you know, enforced by code. And then the policy attributes are in writing, and that's what your white paper and your terms of uh, terms and conditions are for. And then certain attributes are given to you by the market. You can try to design for them, but only the market can give them to you. You can't really control that. It's up to market adoption that determines some of those characteristics. In a token sale, you've got the following uh, uh, groups or ways to allocate. You can give a, give a bunch of away. You can give marketing tokens to people who help with the marketing effort. We did that with the uh, Pillar Project. Some go to founders. There's a cash sale that could be to raise the cash to run the ICO. Then there's a pre-sale of tokens. Uh, then there's the main sale, and then there are potentially future sales. And then you deal with the unsold tokens. So this is kind of the money slide here because I'm trying to show uh, where we are today. And you can see my cursor. So there are three axes here in my, in my chart of um, token types. And the three axes are active versus passive, transferable and non-transferable, and then fixed and unlimited, fixed number. And so in the, in the, it's pretty obvious active and passive. Passive is just for ownership, just for collecting the rent. doesn't let you actually do anything or give you access to anything. It just owns something. And over here we have uh, securities, equity, things that pay the rent or th things that pay rent or in interest, for example. Uh, loans would be a good example. And then um, some are fixed numbered, some are unlimited. Uh, for loans, you probably have unlimited, for example. And then uh, we have transferable and non-transferable. That's pretty obvious. So uh, you may or may not be able to give your airline miles to someone else. Um, often you can't. Your personal uh, like health records or your passport, you wouldn't be able to. There's an unlimited number of passports. They don't have a limit on them. They just make one for every new person or health records or prescriptions, but they're not transferable. And so an active one would be a prescription because it'd be good for 
you know, you, you could hand it over and get a prescription, get your med medicine for it. Um, so that'd be an active token. Government, you know, paying your, your government, your taxes or your parking tickets, those would be, uh, those would be non-transferable uh, unlimited tokens. And then over here, this is the most common for what we have today. That's the utility token. These are sometimes called tradable API keys. Um, and just, you know, to make it clear, we are using the ERC20 token standard on the Ethereum blockchain for these. And it's a fixed number. And it's really a currency model. They, they kind of made this up a long, you know, a couple, year and a half ago to make it so you could make your own little local currency and have fun with it uh, for your group. Um, uh, someone wants to know, by the way, if, if this presentation is available. It is, and you'll see it in the links provided here at Bright Talk. It's also at slideshare.net. Just type my name in and you'll see this, this deck as a PDF. I am also, uh, I'll talk about that a little more later. And so, so here, the ERC-20 token is just really meant for a nice little local currency, uh, you know, for your club or your group or your town or something. And it wasn't really meant for the $3.8 billion we have on it now. And so my goal is to help fix that. Um, you see here in the unlimited, we have tickets. And I've talked about tickets before in other, in other webcasts. Tickets are very much like a, a, a tickets to a concert or tickets to a... a you know, some of them have specific, like a seat and row number, and some of them are just general admission. Uh, but tickets are very popular out here in the real world, and you, you don't see them on the blockchain, so we've got to start working on that. And uh, this, uh, this framework I want to use to present a new way to look and to, to create and sell tokens. Um, so I hear in the real world, you know, we have a lot of tokens that are equity tokens, uh, and those are for the stock market and for pr public and private stock. Um, and they're different from the kind of tokens we're selling today that are the utility tokens. In fact, a lot of them, I think, should be equity tokens. That's why I'm, I'm emphasizing this. But in, in kind of a dollar volume uh, ratio, you know, we have a lot of equity tickets out in the real world, equity tokens. And then we have tickets in the real world that allow you to get on a bus or uh, take your seat at a hockey game or uh, you know, fly on an airplane, take a trip. There's a lot of tickets and most of the digital tokens in your wallet or purse are probably tickets. Um, they're, they're not the kind of thing that uh, is, has a high volatility because there's a limited supply. They have an unlimited supply and a very basically fixed price. So I think a lot of what we're selling today should actually be tickets. And then we have these system tokens that represent money inside a system. And we know those because we're buying those today. But I think it's a bad fit for many projects. Keep in mind that tokens, a token sale or an ICO is project finance. It is not company finance. It's not startup finance. You don't start up, you don't finance your startup with a token sale. Now people do, but that's not the right way to think about it. Why? Because a, a, a token is kind of good for a single thing, like you would use it to pay your uh, expenses in the pillar wallet that we're going to release. Open source that people sell, uh, you know, I, uh, tokens for. And <clears throat> They are not, and that's a project. So you, you get the project going and you, the money is to use that project, that system when it's built and nothing else. You can't buy Ferraris with it. You can't pivot and go say, well, we decided to go open an ice cream parlor, so we're going to use the money for that. You can't do that. Um, anybody who does is committing fraud. On the other hand, an equity token, which would be a, a share of stock, is for exactly that. You're backing a team to go after something they say they'll do in their plan. That almost never works out. 95% of funded startups go out of business, never make a profit, and never make a sustainable profit. And uh, mostly they pivot. So anybody who has ever, who has a successful startup is almost certainly pivoted. And that means you're backing the team and they may be an entirely different business 
from what they said they would. And that's not a, what a system token is for. That's what equity is for. So we hope that we'll switch to an equity model for many, many startups. And guess what? I have a slide next on how should we distribute equity tokens. I'm glad you asked that because I think this is going to be a huge part of the market next year. I think we're going to see dramatic changes to the ICO market. We hope. I'm told there's more than 300 ICOs a week now. It could be as many as 400 ICOs a week. Um, certainly some of those are fraudulent. Certainly some of those are very not transparent. Uh, many of them will pivot and most of them will be worthless. I'm not saying it's a bad asset class. I'm just saying it's a very high risk asset class. And for most of those, the right solution is equity. Equity is stock in your company, your startup. So let's do that. Let's sell, let's do with tokens what we mostly do in the angel world and the venture capital world. Just do it with tokens for the mechanics instead of paper and, pen and, and, and documents. So we'll sell 20 to 40 percent in the, in the, at the beginning. That will get us to first base. That will get us, say, five, six, seven million dollars. And we'll build our, you know, minimum viable product. Um, we'll be locked up for one year. That's the law in the United States. It makes sense as well. Wouldn't make sense to sell equity to people who are trying to get out of your, to, to get out of the deal uh, two weeks later or two months later. That's not what equity is for. After a year, though, if you've met a milestone or two and things are looking good, you can have your second round. Should have stronger demand for that. And then pretty soon somewhere in that second year, you're going to want to start to trade on an exchange. And then by the third round, things we hope are going well. This is for the small number of startups that get that far. And then they will get more funding and there will be more liquidity and the market will start to notice them. So it's kind of like thinking about a mini stock market for startup stock. And that really doesn't exist. Um, that's never been built before, except we're building it. So I'll tell you about that a little later. So we give we give away some of the the, the rights that uh, people have when they currently buy an equity token or a, uh, when they buy an equity share in a company, and we reward them with liquidity so they don't wait five to seven years for their liquidity event. They they can then trade at any stage. They can hold or trade or acquire more. Uh, it should just be market forces managing the token price after about 18 to 24 months. And this is how that looks, just a different way to see it. So we have the, you may sell a bit ahead of time, a pre-sale, and then you'll have an, uh, to raise enough money to say, I don't know, do your minimum, your demo, or uh, you know, wh whatever makes sense. Uh, that's often the, the pre-seed, we call it. And then we have the initial offering, and then we'd have further offerings, and the founders can have, uh, you know, whatever's left, uh, depending on how many, after how many offer, uh, uh, rounds. But in the venture world, uh, by the time you're done with the fourth round, the founders typically share around 10%, and everybody has had quite a bit of dilution. And dilution is built into this token model as well. Dilution is, is a good thing when you're starting companies that are very high risk. So you you get more uh, you get more equity up or you get more equity up front and later rounds as the risk is diminished later rounds will uh, will dilute your your ownership the percentage you own of the company. All right, so now we can do tickets and when we sell tickets, a good example is if you've got a, a, a best selling game that people really like and then. And then you've got a new idea for a new game and you've got a lot of followers. And you, you know, you go to Kickstarter and see a bunch of this stuff where some guys or some people, a team have said, yeah, we, you know us, we've, uh, you know, we built this game or this product or whatever. Now we've got a new idea and we want to finance it. So we're going to finance it through the future sale of product. It's not a limited supply token. It's an open supply ticket. So, but at first to get it going, we're going to sell a limited number of these tickets to our eager early adopters, the people who really want this game because they're so excited about our last game. They know us or they, they've got some ex reason that we, you know, we made a video pitch and they love it. And just as, as happens on Kickstarter all the time. Uh, and it's again, not for companies. It's just for a product, right? Just, just like on Kickstarter, 
you'd sell a limited number of tickets to get to first base to get your your project out the door and then those people would have their tickets to spend and they'd be the first ones in they could be tradable by the way they, they could trade for twice as much when the risk is reduced for example those premium tickets would then get in first and they'd be able to experience the the thrill of the new product whatever it is could be a frying pan as far as i'm concerned <laughs> doesn't matter and then and then when they have had their fill and and the, you know you, you see that the that the first period has died down then you you go for the second batch and again you raise money by selling a second batch again a limited number um, but then over time you sell more batches and just work your way toward uh, kind of an equilibrium uh, open model you can buy as many as you like so now we're basically selling poker chips um, they just uh, uh, you just buy the tickets and you use them and then and then they go away or they go back to the cashier and people can buy them again um, there are a couple different models there that I discuss in my essay uh, eventually you get to a continuous issue model where you sold several rounds uh, to raise the money to make it better and better and better and then you know you're selling tickets and every time you sell a ticket you uh, you make money so it depends if you're if you're the end product or if you're a platform, but uh, there are business models for all these, and it's much better than the insane ERC20 limited number that we sell today. So I'm hoping that you know we kind of work our way over the next 12 months of this model, where it's it's quite a bit of equity for companies, it's tickets for products, and it's some system tokens for some projects as we have today, small percentage. That also keeps us out of the crosshairs of the SEC, by the way. And I failed to mention that in the equity model, when you're, and some people are probably wondering this or even asking, I'm not sure, uh, uh, if this is only available to accredited investors. In the United States, that means $1 million or more outside of your, your owning your home to make investments and at least $200,000 if you're single uh, in the last two years of income. This is the law. Can't sell equity startup tokens to the public by law. Unfortunately, um, I actually think you should be able to, but um, you know, if I did that, I'd be in violation of the law and that would be bad. Uh, so we're going to create a market where we will sell equity tokens to accredited investors using the pillar wallet. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then they'll be tradable only to other accredited investors, hopefully in other countries as well. That's, that's our goal. <laughs> <clears throat> not easy we're kind of reinventing markets here but that's that's what we get to do with blockchain reinvent everything and take a lot of the fees and, and expenses out so <clears throat> here's another idea I have <clears throat> that I want to discuss I want to put forth this idea so here it is <clears throat> um, we should not be selling these limited number you know uh, v volatile price tokens for basic units of value. For example, in the energy world, we'd have a kilowatt second or a kilowatt minute maybe. Uh, that's a basic unit that really shouldn't belong to anybody. That's kind of the wholesale unit of energy and that should be created as a ticket because there's, there's an unlimited number of <clears throat> kilowatt seconds over the next you know several thousand <laughs> of years. Uh, we don't want a fixed number. We want a single kilowatt second to be represented by a token that can be produced wholesale by anyone producing energy and then sold into the market and could be purchased by resellers, could be purchased by end, you know, P2P by end buyers. Um, there could be value added people who create cool new things on top of that. So just look at it here for energy, you'd have the protocol blockchain. That's like, a, you know, the ether token. And then you'd, buy your fundamental tokens that would be your your kilowatt second at the wholesale and then the service tokens would add value to that and use them as rewards or gamify them or uh, you know in in various appliances would work with them at the retail level and in each case you kind of have the right price for the right unit and nobody owns it nobody owns these fundamental tokens um, they are owned by nonprofits and they're they're not volatile with the price with the supply and demand of the token they pay for the wholesale price of the kilowatt second so they have market value for their underlying uh, uh you know unit that they are that they represent 
it's the same with art. You wouldn't want to have a bunch of separate ICOs for, for, this, for the art coin because then as a collector, you're going to have different types of coins so they, don't, they won't be tradable. You'll have different systems that don't know all these different types. Someone would, could come up with another type. You, you want the art uh, world to issue a single basic token, and it might not cost much. It might cost a tenth of a penny to get this token. Uh, this is kind of similar to a barcode. You know, there is a company that issues barcodes it calls, called GS1, and uh, they don't charge much for barcodes. You know, you get to charge for your product, but you don't really pay very much for the barcode itself, um, just enough to keep that whole infrastructure going. Same with art. You'd want uh, kind of a, a group to come together and issue a, a, uh, a public resource called a one work of art token. Uh, and the same with prescriptions. You'd want a prescription token. In fact, uh, we're having meetings in New York City about that coming up in the next few months. So anyone interested in health records and prescriptions, please get in touch with me. Uh, we want to talk about a basic prescription token for the industry that's just a public good. Uh, then you could create prescriptions on top of that by taking a token and, and then adding value to it. But the basic prescription token or the basic seat on an airplane or a container or an item on the supply chain or storage, it should just be a public good that is managed by a nonprofit and not competition among various groups with ICOs saying, well, we've got the kilowatt minute or the artwork or the prescription. That should not be one group that, that's competing with other groups. That should just be a basic thing. All right, so that's the new stack I'm hoping to build this year. And I'm interested in creating new token standards for different types of investments. Some of these will only will be securities and they'll only be available to uh, accredited investors. Again, I'm sorry, but that's just the law. Uh, some will be securities and could be registered and then sold through broker dealers to the public, just as, as Apple stock is. I, I'll be surprised if most major stocks, company stocks are not blockchain tokens or some kind of decentralized token or at least a cryptographic token within the next five to ten years. Uh, it's just going to reduce cost tremendously and make settlement far more accurate, cheap, and, and, and less expensive. So, so we're going to tokenize a lot of things. We're going to tokenize the world. And let's do it with better token standards. If you want to join me in crafting international token standards that are better than the ERC-20 standard, I hope you'll contact me. I'll put some working groups together for that. And by the way, if you have ERC-20 tokens, just like the pillar token, I guess within the next five years, we'll probably just port those over to better token standards anyway. So I think in five to 10 years, all those, most of those ERC-20 tokens will go away, re be replaced by better standards. Now, just to wrap up, I've got, I'll just spend about another, oh, 10 minutes or so talking about guidelines, and then I'll take questions. So, uh, can I explain the pyramid again? I think I did. Uh, okay, sure, take it, sure. Someone asked, can I, can I explain this pyramid? So the protocol to token would be the, the Ether uh, token for the Ethereum blockchain. That's where we would store stuff. We could, of course, create a new uh, prescription blockchain, but I don't think we'll need to. And then the fundamental token would be a prescription token that wouldn't cost much. It would be, you know, given given out to anybody who wants one. And then, and then the service companies would provide that that infrastructure and those apps between the physician and the patient and the prescription uh, and the, and the pharmacy. And yes, we are working on this, so I'm pretty well versed in it. And anybody who wants to. Uh, learn more, can please contact me. I think we're, we've, got, we've also got a, a, a prescription channel going in our community at 2030.io. Uh, come to our community, and uh, we'll be talking about prescriptions in one of the channels there. And then a meta token, which I didn't mention, so thanks for asking. A meta token is like the pillar token. There will be millions and millions of tokens. In fact, there will be millions of kinds of tokens. So you don't want to deal with all those tokens just to, you know, buy uh, energy, pay for energy, or um, or uh, use a uh, or get a prescription. You you might just use a meta token like a pillar token. And now I'm going to do a quick question. Uh, 
is a fun one, and just to see if everybody's being paying attention. So here, here I am. I'm in. I'm in Gibraltar, and we had some questions about what are tokens before. Here's another one. This is a quiz for you. What is this? You don't have to vote. Just answer to yourself. Is this a token? As you can tell, this is not a token. This is a garbage bag. So I'm, I'm sure you all got that. That was an easy one. However, we throw away the garbage bag and we take out this. What is this? Uh-huh. This is something looks kind of familiar. What does it say on here? Whoops. Stadt Bern. City of Bern. Still a garbage can. Is this a token? Is this a token? Yes. This is a token. The, the former garbage can, which I threw too far away, costs about three cents to make and sells for about five cents. This, uh, not garbage can, garbage bag, sorry. Those garbage bags, you buy a roll of those for five or six dollars. This costs one Swiss franc, which is one dollar. This, this garbage bag costs one dollar. This is a token. It has a substrate. It has uh, authentication, authentication information on the sub on the substrate. <laughs> I can't get it right. And then it has it carries a payload <laughs> of garbage, <laughs> and that means it's a bearer instrument. You pay one dollar and you can throw away 35 liters worth of garbage in the city of Bern, and anyone can do it. There are no accounts. Have you heard me say this before about the blockchain? There are no accounts to this token system in the city of Bern. Uh, they don't know their customers in the city of Bern. They have no idea. You could come from China and need to throw some garbage away, buy yourself one of these for a, a franc, stick it in a container, and you use the system with no data, no, no personal data has been transmitted. It's a bearer instrument. You can give it or trade it. You can give it as a Christmas present. I guess they're valuable. going to pay about $20 for a roll of these, and that's the most sophisticated, advanced, and by the way, cost-saving garbage billing system in the entire world. And we are going through this kind of token system for many, many other things like prescriptions. I know there's a delay there, so it's gonna, it's gonna be annoying if I stay on screen, but that was fun. Um, I think we'll see more and more physical tokens and many, many, many more digital tokens, and I hope we'll use this stack here. Oh yes, I have my mouse. This stack here to uh, make all these industries far more efficient and really take out the middleman. So uh, we discussed this. I'm looking for people to help create these standards. This is both uh, from a governance and definition standpoint and also uh, write smart contracts. And now the guidelines. So now I've got uh, some principles for projects. If you, and I, I'm not going to take a vote, but I assume a bunch of people here, we've got 400 people on the call, are planning an ICO, are thinking about tokens. So here are my recommendations. You don't need to do what everyone else is doing this year. You can stage your offering with a clear monetary policy and just offer a small number uh, well, uh, you know, could be millions, but a small percentage of your tokens. And uh, you should go for $10 million or less. You should really get to first base and not shoot for the moon. We should not be building world domination into the price of our token offerings. And, I'm, and I know that total amount re, uh, received by ICOs is on the way down, and I expect it will continue to go down because you just don't need $50 million to get you know your product or your system launched. Um, there might be a few exceptions where it might be $20, $20 million in some, uh, in some cases of, uh, of a uh, uh, not nonprofit, of a, uh, an open source project, but really $10 million is enough to build almost any system and then you can sell more later and you should. So I'm looking for a hard cap of $10 million and then ship, raise, and repeat. If it's a company, don't make up a phony token. 
We all know that the purpose of most tokens is to raise money. Uh, in most cases, once you've raised the money, you don't really want to have to deal with the little token that you've issued to everybody. It'd be better if it would just go away, but it won't. And those people can get plenty mad, and you may find yourself in court up against the documents you wrote and used to market those tokens. And it just doesn't make sense for many startups to make up a token and sell that. It's better to do it with equity. And now that uh, my group is building a liquid a market for liquidity for those things, uh, we hope to that you know, a year from now we'll see many, many, many more uh, equity offerings to high net worth people. Um, every single document you make, you may be facing in court. Um, don't give information to individuals. If someone emails me and asks for something, I don't respond during an ICO because that's the, I, I want the public to have that. I don't want one person to have more. Besides, if you if you answer somebody's question, they're just going to follow up with another question. So, so don't give out informa information asymmetrically. Give it out so everyone has the same information. We use YouTube to do that. You can use a frequently asked questions. Use your website. Use use Twitter, use social media, uh, but don't answer questions individually. I don't, I don't like that because then uh, people who ask a lot of questions will have more information. Um, discounts like 70, 80, 90% off, that's pure desperation. Um, people who buy in the pre-sale at 50% off, you know, do they really stick around and hold or do they sell in the first couple of months? Uh, I'm sure you can probably figure out what generally happens there. So I don't believe, I, I believe you could give a good discount at the very beginning to raise some money to run the ICO. That's, you know, $100,000, $200,000 maybe, that's fine. Uh, but then your pre-sale shouldn't be at much more of a discount than about 10%. Um, and if you can only sell so many at 10%, then only sell so many. I don't think discounting is the way to success. I think providing value is the way to success. I hope that makes sense. I am also interested in the clean communication program. This is something uh, we made up after seeing what really happens in the media. I will warn you now, if you are a token buyer, all, all media outlets are now compromised. All channels have been compromised. There is no, there are no independent voices out there. Um, someone is taking tokens or being remunerated or it's worth that for that person for some monetary reason to tell you about a particular token. So hearing about it on YouTube, uh, reading about it on Reddit and Bitcoin talk, these people are all being rewarded or paid for their voices. And as soon as the token launch is over, the ICO is over, they don't care at all about those tokens. They will sell them immediately and go on to the next one. So I want everyone to declare conflicts of interest. And this is my little thing. I hope people will join me if you're in the PR industry. If you're in the sound of my voice and you know people who would be interested in this, please have them contact me. We've got a channel for this already, I think, at 2030.io slash community. And we want people to declare. I am compensated in, in product one way or another. I am compensated in cash. I am compensated in equity. And or I receive no compensation. That's a big deal. If someone is talking about a project, and this is not just for ICOs, this is for, you know, Kickstarter or, or selling anything. Uh, Tony Robbins comes to mind. I receive no compensation from the company. That would be rare, but fascinating and great to know. And uh, so my goal is to make these little badges uh, semantic so they could be found by search engines. You could search, for example, for bloggers who are, or for videos that are not receiving any compensation. There is a truth in blogging law. You may be aware of that. Well, my goal is to bring a truth in media, truth in uh, social media to all projects. And that's the Clean Communication Project. Please contact me if you want to move that forward. Um, I'm very limited on time, but very happy to help with that. So for buyers, if you're a token buyer, I recommend 95% uh, or more are going to be worthless. That means you buy 20 tokens and you'll have 19 losers and one winners. That's how you should think of it. Don't invest more than you can lose. Do not prepay for world domination. Uh, let them get there in stages. Prepay for stage one. Nothing over 20 million. That's insane. Five to 10 million is usually all anybody needs to realize the first stage of a dream. Pivots will be common. Many, 
many, many, many tokens will be worthless. If you're doing, by the way, building your own portfolio, take as much as you can as you want to allocate, not as much as you can, as is reasonable to allocate, uh, not much more than you're willing to lose all of, and then just use flat weighting. Just divide by N and divide by 20, divide by 30, divide by 40, and put 1 40th of that money into uh, each of 40 projects. Uh, don't do 10. 10 is not enough. Not enough diversification. See my other webinar on postmodern portfolio theory to get the lowdown on diversification. Now, what are we doing at Pillar? What are we doing at 2030? Pillar is a nonprofit foundation based in Switzerland whose goal is to produce the world's best wallet. You can find our wallet roadmap on uh, medium.com. We're going to ship the ICO and token wallet first. I hope by the end of Q1, that's when I promised it for, but the truth is it will ship when it's good and tested, and it's all about testing and making sure that it's safe before we release it. Uh, we're still on track, and we expect it to ship, uh, I would say, sometime in March. Uh, but we'll see, and I'll let you know more about that if you're subscribed to our newsletter at pillarproject.io. Uh, that is just the software that lets you buy ICOs. To put the ICOs on the wallet, there's a group that is a trusted a uh, third party that's going to be vetting and onboarding these projects, and that's 2030. That's my for-profit company. We are raising a private round of $3 million right now to accredited investors only, and we will have our first uh, uh, equity ICO. We're going to eat our own dog food uh, by putting our – the first one will be our 2030 equity ICO for accredited investors only on the Pillar wallet. And that, we hope, will be sometime after the wallet ships. So, so we're talking about March or April, and there we'll raise about $10 million from accredited investors. We are also building an ICO platform on the wallet for normal ICOs that are not for accredited people. You'll, you'll get a KYC check, a Know Your Customer check, and then you'll be able to participate in ICOs in a much safer way than we do today with My Ether Wallet, which, you know... I, my Ether Wallet is good because it exists and we can use it, but also about $200 million were hacked and fished out of my Ether Wallets this year, um, and it is just not a safe wallet. It's just people who are new to this just can't. You know, I use it safely, but lots of people use with my Ether Wallet, and we're going to provide a better uh, wallet on the phone, the Pillar Wallet. And then uh, finally, at 2030, we're going to, so, so you'll be able to buy normal ICOs that we vet. And by the way, any other company or group that wants to vet ICOs and uh, onboard them, we're open source. We'd like that. So if you want, if your company is capable of that, uh, contact me. We'd like that very much. Um, then we have the whitelist exchange, which is, again, only for accredited investors, uh, but may also be for tokens that uh, have ICOs. We're looking into that. Uh, but it's for accredited investors to exchange uh, to buy and sell tokens so that there's liquidity, and that's the name of the game when you want to tokenize equity. It's all about liquidity. So, wow, that's another 48 minutes with David Siegel. I'm glad the sound is better. The sun is setting now in, uh, oh, it's beautiful. Let me just show you. There's a huge some container ship. There's like a, some kind of a tanker ship out there. And that's my sunset in Gibraltar. I will now go to questions. And I have about uh, 12 minutes or so for questions. So, will you help me do an equity ICO for my company? You will go to uh, tokenfactory.io and get on the mailing list and learn about that. We are just going to be starting that up as soon as we – we've got to first raise our $3 million to hire the people uh, to staff this up. But our goal uh, six months from now is to be doing about 20, I 20 public ICOs a month uh, a week. And we have a lot of demand for equity. to ask about equity ICOs, uh, but first we have to build the machine to get them out. So keep an eye on, on uh, tokenfactory.io and get the newsletter at uh, pillarproject.io for now. And then we'll have more newsletters as this, as this gets bigger. Um, so I'm going to try to go here to the very first questions and just see what people have asked. Um, what are the capital gains, tax policy issues? If I hold a cryptocurrency for more than a year, that's a general question. But if you, uh, but right now, most, uh, especially non-equity tokens, most utility tokens are seen sort of as currencies, 
as though you had bought, say, a pillar token at 10 cents, and if you hold it and later sell it for 20 cents, then you have a capital gain of, of 10 cents. You've doubled your money. Um, it's a, it, if you hold it for more than a year, I think it's a long-term capital gain. So um, can there be a duplicate token in another decentralized system? Not in any, not, not really. I mean, we have pennies in England and pennies in the United States and no one confuses them and those are not considered duplicates. So different systems have their own versions of tokens. Um, uh, is it still possible to get a pillar token? Boy, they're pretty difficult to come by. You could look on Ether Delta and see if anybody's selling them. We do have a solution for exchanging pillar tokens that I can't talk about, but it's very exciting. Um, can't say when and I can't say what, but you'll, you'll like it when we announce it. Can we tokenize electronic health records or prescriptions? Essentially, we can. Um, you know, the whole record is a many different parts. So uh, we will be decentralizing the records and we will be tokenizing the keys that give access to those. And if you want to talk about prescriptions, again, come to 2030.io slash community and join us. Um, we can sell non-accredited investors through Regulation A. That is right, Crowdfunding Jobs Act. Uh, we can sell to, you can sell equity that way and we will not be part of that um, because that's for small projects for the public and doesn't have much future because the public can't then trade the stock later when you raise five or ten million dollars later. That's not going to be tradable. So it's great for starting a restaurant maybe or, uh, you know, uh, some little local business. It's not good for scalable businesses. So we will not be using crowdfunding. Um, what about token that would solve non-disclosure agreements or patents? Uh, we'd have to talk about that in another session. There are tokens being made for all kinds of things. Um, I don't believe much in NDAs anyway, but sometimes you, you do need them. I, I don't know, uh, could we tokenize uh, legal agreements? Uh, you could, you know what? You wouldn't, sorry, you wouldn't. You would have a smart contract. That's what smart contracts do, right? So you use a smart contract for that, and then you just use like Ether for a token or something for that probably. Um, so I'm interested in setting token standards for the real estate deeds for owning real estate. That's awesome. How do I get on the committee? I don't know. We've got to make it from scratch. So uh, let's do that. Come to 2030.io and get in the community and let's, let's start a channel for that. Uh, why do we need art or energy tokens? What's the utility over money? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm, I really want to answer that um, because art tokens make fractional art ownership easy and liquid. Can't do this with paper and you can't do this easily with money. A bunch of people could get together and buy a $20 million painting and divide it into 500 pieces or 5,000 pieces and you could buy, accumulate, sell, trade your part of that, build your, your portfolio in the same way that, you know, it's not, it's, you wouldn't call it a utility token, you call it like an art token. You might want to display the art, but you might not. You might want to invest in art. And in that case, you might want a broadly diversified portfolio. And in fact, I could imagine us creating an art token index. So now you get, ask, you get exposure to the asset class through tokens, and you don't have the risk of a single uh, piece of art. You might have 100 or 200 pieces of art in that, in that index. And that is financial engineering. Sorry, I'm looking at my microphone. I should look at you. <laughs> Sorry, and that is financial engineering that we can't do in today's world. Now I'm looking at you. Isn't that a lot better? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so yeah, and there's huge advantages because we can create systems that use tokens that take lots of middlemen out. You might think you're getting a good deal on your energy price, but in fact, uh, you you know, there will be games. There will be there will be systems that reward you for turning off lights and saving energy. For, using, for sending energy back to the grid, for charging your car battery at night. All these kinds of things will let us have lot, tremendous amounts of innovation in the energy space and in many other spaces by making them fundamentally programmable. And that is what the blockchain is all about. If you don't understand that, please go somewhere here on Bright Talk to my Introduction to Blockchain talk, which will tell you a lot about the world and the promise of blockchain and decentralization because it's a big deal and tokens are at the heart of it. 
So let's see. Uh, you, you're, you're. Uh, let's see. I'm a real estate owner. Can I create an ICO for the purpose of raising equity needed to invest in real estate only from people who would be allowed to invest in real estate because that would be a fund and a fund is classified as an alternative investment which would only be sellable, keep looking at the wrong thing, to, to accredited investors. Um, so for accredited investors, you could create a fund and we'll tokenize it for you at Token Factory, put it onto the whitelist exchange. This is all coming next year. Um, so this is the whole world of alternative assets, hedge funds, uh, partnership interests, startup stock, growth stock, private equity. Our goal is to disintermediate this world and uh, politely tell the venture capitalists and the private equity guys to go polish up their resumes and get other jobs, and I'm sure they can add value to society in some other way. Uh, but liquid markets will very likely replace them and do a better job and provide better return on investment money, on capital. Better ways to allocate capital. That's what the blockchain, that's what 2030 is all about. Oh, I've got a few more minutes. Uh, have I heard of Trade.io? No. <laughs> have I? <laughs> There's literally like 15 or 20 new ICOs every single day. Um, Ah, uh, regulation A is for 50 million to non-accredited investors in 12 months. I don't think so. Not 50 million. I think a lot of those have to be accredited. Uh, we have securities lawyers working for us. We're starting a broker dealer in the United States. By the way, if you are a securities lawyer and you know all this stuff, we have a big meeting on Tuesday in London with many securities lawyers coming, and we have working groups, and you're welcome to join us. Uh, we're kind of a crowdsourced company, so we love that. And we have a lot to do to build a broker dealer in the United States. We have a beginning of a team started and we'll be uh, issuing, uh, selling to and allowing tradeability between accredited investors under probably, and I think it's Reg A, 506C. Is that part of Reg, Reg A? That's the one we're looking at now, but we, we may have a menu of different options. And we are, we're very interested in working with the SEC to get approval for our broker dealer ahead of time. And, uh, if you want to join us on that journey, we're very open to that. Uh, so I want to disintermediate the middleman. Can I have a token for that? Sure you can. If it's a real utility token, and especially if it's open source software, then you know the, today's ERC-20 tokens may be for you. An ICO may be the right thing. If it's really a company, then we're going to want to issue stock through tokens, and that's what we're working on. Hey, is Edo wallet a kind of temporary wallet? I have no idea. Oh, what can you use before the pillar wallet? Uh, use my Ether wallet and don't use it too much. It's pretty scary. Uh, I'm sorry for all the people who are getting fished and hacked on my Ether wallet. We are working as hard as we can and we will ship our wallet as soon as it's good and tested. And it can't come too soon for me. I've got a lot of friends saying, please, please get me that wallet so I can stop having to deal with my Ether wallet. Um, really good people at my Ether wallet and good code, but wow, the phishing is just unbelievable. So be careful. Never click a link to go to my Ether wallet. M type it in and then make a bookmark for my Ether wallet and use your bookmark. Never ever click a link that says myetherwallet.com. It does not take you to myetherwallet.com, even though it looks like it does. It's a fake my Ether wallet site, and there are tons of. Uh, 506E is Reg D. Gosh, whoever you are, and I appreciate it, yes. And, you know, I'm not the legal expert, but I've got a team of legal experts working on this, and uh, we need you. So please jump into uh, uh, 2030.io slash community and uh, let us know because we've got lots of meetings and documents to share right away. Um, we are a for-profit company, but we pretty much run open source. We want to share and get the benefit of all our fantastic uh, uh, people who are supporting us. What's your estimate of the value of Bitcoin at the end of 2017? Oh my gosh, it's up to $15,000 today? I have no idea. It's, it's really important to understand the volatility. The volatility in any given month is 40%. So if it does get to 20000 then it could easily go back to $12,000. Uh, it is not a bubble that if you want me to do the bubble thing, I don't have time, I'm out of time. It is not in a bubble. I will write more about that in my newsletter at pillarproject.io. Uh, please come join us. 
uh, I don't have too much more time. Um, uh, never click any links ever. Well, you want to click a link if it goes to uh, PillarProject.io so you can read about it, but never click, click a link that has to do with selling you something in the, in the uh, cryptocurrency world. Uh, cryptocurrencies generally are not a bubble. A bubble is if after it crashes, it's worthless and no one ever buys again and it's not a screaming buy. If, if Bitcoin goes down to 8,000 tomorrow, I guarantee you it would be a screaming buy and tons of people would jump into it. That is, that means by definition, it is not a bubble. If it's a buy, if it gets cut in half and that presents a buying opportunity, it is not a bubble. Very few things that people think are bubbles are actually bubbles. I'm going to have to say goodbye very quickly before everybody, before the system kicks me off. But I really appreciate it. We are in London. We have a big meeting coming up on Monday for Pillar University. You're welcome to join us. We have a meeting on Tuesday for legal. We will invite you if you're a securities lawyer. Uh, and we'll be communicating much more about this. I am killing the ICO show, but I will be here for you. And I'll be in this channel on Bright Talk all next year doing all kinds of fun shows. And by the way, on the 13th of December, we're doing the last ICO show, which is a wrap-up. Boy, that's next week. I think it's next Wednesday a wrap-up of the ICO market for 2017. I'll have two special guests. We'll be broadcasting live from London. I think it's at 5 p.m. London time next Wednesday. Join me. Join us. We'll wrap up and give you the stats and the scary stories and the excitement for 2018 right here on my Bright Talk channel. Thank you so much for participating. We'll see you in the forums at pillarproject.io and at 2030.io. They're both running. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye from Gibraltar. <laughs>